Hi, everybody, and welcome to our FANCAST webinar, Aspects of Modern In-House Streaming from DAB FM to Archiving. I'm really pleased to welcome you. And also, we are really pleased because today our webinar is live on LinkedIn in parallel for the first time. So that's the first. Thank you for taking time out and uh, joining us. Today, we will uh, discuss new options for DAB and uh, for using DAB and FM signals as input. Our webinar will uh, last, like always, 45 minutes, and there will be time at the end for the Q&A sessions. But please feel free to uh, uh, write your question in the chat during the presentation. Um, we have some Fancast uh, experts also uh, today with us, and they, uh, they can answer the, the questions directly uh, in the chat. You will also get a chance to win a Fancast t-shirt with our traditional quiz, so stay tuned. And last information, um, I will send uh, out the recording of this webinar to all the participants. Let me introduce you now the speakers of the day. Tobias Donbush, product expert at uh, Fancast, and Ben Geiser, senior audio engineer at Fancast. Let's have a look at the agenda now. Declan Visa, Fancast CEO, will first give a short introduction of Fancast application and some DAB and FM background. Then Tobias uh, Dambush will give you an overview of uh, Extreme software with some examples of in-house streaming. Then Bernd Geiser will present the new Extreme feature set for receiving multiplex signals. Uh, Tobias Donbush will then come back to uh, show you how to use Extreme for in-house streaming. And uh, Dutchlef Wieser will uh, conclude with a summary of uh, DAB, FM, and DVB application. And as I said, there will be time at the end for some questions and answer. Let me give the floor now to Detlef Wiese, Fancast CEO, who is going to give you a short introduction of Fancast application and some DAB and FM background. Yeah, thank you, Virginie, for this nice introduction and uh, good morning, everybody, or good evening. We have, I think, participants from a variety of uh, different time zones uh, in the world, so thanks for staying so awake here, uh, far away. Yeah, just um, I want to show you a bit about um, Fancast, where we come from. So we started in 2018, four and a half years ago, with the main objective to develop a software for 24-7 live radio, live audio applications. Um, first customer we had with um, Deutschland Radio and the streaming, and from there really we had the possibility to grow first in the German uh, market. I think I can say that we are the number one in, in streaming. OTT streaming for radio in the, in the German market. And um, yeah, the team grew uh, over 2020, 2021, and uh, we also had more and more applications. We consist of former Maya people and IKS, PhDs and master um, people, uh, developers. Um, the um, software in total, although we are a very young company, we counted that we have actually already invested more than 30 person years of development. And um, now we are going more international with all the applications we have, like OTT, SIP communication, WebRTC, and so on. And we can say that um, um, the product, which is called Extreme, actually is a, a bit like a matrix. And this matrix consists of uh, input and output nodes and nodes in between for processing and protocols and different types of features. This can be storage, can be loudness. It can have a variety of audio uh, encoding types, can have different uh, inputs from ICECAST to AS67, LiveWire, and so on. It's really a, a quite big range. And we say always the connection from the input to the output is a chain, and we call this pipe. So that's something you may hear also more often during this um, seminar, this, this workshop. In terms of application, although we are very young, uh, we have already uh, achieved quite a range of applications. As I said, we started with the online radio streaming, added podcast creation on the fly, transcoding, 
studio transmitter links because we do very secure transmission, live transmission, loudness processing. Zip is a very important part, also WebRTC, whole Zip area, even including Zip hubs, answering machines, Zip servers, and then also more recently DVB multiplexing, demultiplexing, and then also DAB and FM to streaming, I think, where we have a focus um, today. I would like to give a bit of um, very, very roughly, because it's not a it's not a DAB or FM uh, seminar, but just a bit background for those who might not be too familiar. So DAB versus FM, I mean, the digital radio DAB is a multiplex system, while FM is a single carrier one. And uh, now with uh, DAB Plus, we have up to, yeah, let's say 30 DAB programs in one ensemble. If you, the bitrate is, is not too high, Otherwise, it could also be a bit uh, less. In the past, with DAB1, we had, let's say, 15, 16 programs, uh, roughly. So the encoding has changed over the years, while the channel coding and the error concealment and stuff like this has stayed stable for the, for the during the system development. Yeah, if we look to the DAB standards, started, yeah, uh, I'm not supposed to say that, uh, because there, a question may come to you also about this. So it has been further developed now with HEAC, and it can transmit in a variety of bands. So it depends a bit on the countries in which bands the transmission takes place. There are lots of standards to be fulfilled. And if we look to the availability and have a look on the map, we can see that there is a very, very strong focus in uh, Europe and uh, Australia. And a few other countries are picking up, but we see also the gray areas that there is still a lot without DAB, some areas it has been even switched off uh, again. So I would say Australia and Europe is, is a very strong area. Some others are, are coming up now. Because we have also FM today in, in connection, of course, with modern encoding and uh, modern functions as a topic. Um, I mean, FM is available, uh, available very, very, very widely. And when DAB, come, of, DAB came, of course, there were quite a lot of interesting discussions in lots of countries to switch off FM almost not immediately but very soon those decisions have all been postponed and are not, not in discussion anymore I think the only country which really made something like a migration decision was Norway in 2017 saying yeah we plan to switch off FM but also with a long migration period so that means we can see that most likely FM will stay also for a while and um, is not out of um, discussion when we talk about technical solutions, system solutions and products. So in terms of coverage area, yeah, we have a lot of, for instance, in Germany, 97% um, coverage area with DAB programs. And um, as I said, um, FM in parallel, of course, some programs are only FM, some are only on, on DAB and that's probably also valid for a lot of um, other countries. The market opportunities, because I mean, we will talk about technical solution, but of course also it's interesting to see where are the applications and where we see opportunities with the technology and functions we explained today is in-house streaming of DAB and FM signals, monitoring DAB and FM signals, archiving is another one, resending, rebroadcasting, so that DAB or FM could go via other media like streaming or go in other multiplexes. And of course, also may, maybe measuring uh, signal strength and quality behavior, CRCs or, or whatever. So let me give, I think, the word back to Virginie. Tobias is going now to present the pipe concept and then the general overview of extreme software. Exactly. So. Uh... You will get a more detailed view uh, into this later, uh, especially when uh, Bernd and then I uh, look a bit more at our user interface, the user interface for iXtreme. But just so you understand the important basics, uh, the way how we do the connection setup in our system is via the so-called pipe concept. And the idea behind this is that the uh, entire audio connection from the input to the output, everything that goes through the system, is modeled as this row of elements, which we call the pipe, with the pipe elements being, you know, these individual circles or balls or whatever you would like to uh, call them here. The big advantages there is uh, how easy specific elements are to switch out, how simple and straightforward it is to build a connection um, that you can easily see everything on 
in one view, everything that happens to the audio signal. And uh, we also believe that it's just more intuitive uh, way to set up a connection without having to go into dozens of sub menus and the like. But you'll see this in more detail later. And next, I will take over here for a moment to show you a few examples of in-house streaming and uh, audio stream reuse. So of course, as we have uh, implied at the beginning, the focus is a little bit on uh, using DAB and FM as an input, but uh, in these examples that I will uh, present, um, we also will look at it a bit broader, uh, anything where any sort of application where you know, you're streaming into your company uh, environment, network, et cetera, or where you're simply reusing audio content that uh, already exists in the wild, as it were. So these uh, examples are partially actual projects that we have done or are in the process of doing, but also some uh, general examples just to give you an idea how uh, these things may be relevant and things that we are in fact able to do with iXtreme. So our first example is uh, having an um, or creating an audio stream for your internal network so that uh, various clients can uh, reuse it. So the example would of course be using audio that exists somewhere, could be a restream from a URL or just an, uh, a regular output stream that you also happen to stream into your own network, perhaps via RTP, UDP, multicasts, et cetera, or just as a simple HTTP stream. And then various clients uh, as part of your company or organization can use various programs or perhaps their own decoders, et cetera, to receive those streams and then do monitoring or um, reuse those signals in various ways. And of course, this could also be done with uh, multiple iStream installations as well. And of course, this is also a way how to organize internal archiving, long-term storage, quality assurance, uh, future reuse of recordings, et cetera. A similar example would be uh, using audio, web audio that is already existing on the internet um, and then streaming it into your own network. Here we have a fairly specific example where a, uh, a customer used, yeah, internet uh, audio, as I just said, took this into an um, internal demilitarized zone just for uh, safety purposes, they didn't want to just stream it directly into their network from the public internet. And their iStream installations stand, which receive the streams, and then in turn, via, of course, uh, appropriately complex uh, network um, uh, setups, firewall navigation, etc., stream this via RTP into the company's internal network, where it, that audio is then reused in various ways, including further broadcasting for specific purposes. Uh, another example, this is also a specific one. Um, we have one customer that uses their own large national DVB multiplex, which we demux, and then feed their online radio uh, portfolio this way. So there's an already uh, existing DVB multiplex that the customer is uh, producing through some other system, including 128 programs in total, actually. But, uh, four of our systems, DMUX, this multiplex, embed partially new metadata, in some cases also transcode the audio into new bit rates and formats um, as the case may be. And then, of course, it is streamed to a CDN for output as uh, internet audio, Icecast, HLS, RTMP, Dash, basically everything you can imagine. And in fact, in total, this is a, one of our biggest projects because if you account for all the different outputs, bit rates, etc., then we are arriving at like uh, uh, 1,400 outputs in total. Uh, somewhat similar, but even more complex, we have a customer who uses an existing FM signal. Uh, in fact, uh, these are partially regional FM signals. Also adding some local AS uh, EBU inputs um, from like reports, etc., cetera, um, to create an MPEG-TS for DBB compliant broadcasting. Uh, this is in fact uh, nine different uh, regions that are fed there. 
the um, SRT is also used in some cases as an output, or the systems are set up to support this as well when the situation requires it. And perhaps also very interesting, since we mentioned archiving as well, uh, the central system of these nine also records the audio that is being input uh, that is being received via the FM and all, uh, input via the uh, digital input and uh, uploads it to an external storage, which is, of course, also coming back to the archiving topic. A bit uh, besides the main uh, topic, but also nice to know, there's also a setup so that uh, technicians and admins can basically call a SIP number to monitor specific outputs, which I suppose you could also, with an iStream system, use to further restream uh, with the right uh, setup. Of course, you could use those uh, SIP calls to gateway into yet other um, outputs. Right. Uh, next one, IceCast streams to MPEG-TS. So um, this is somewhat unusual in the sense that uh, although IceCast streams are used as an input, it's not IceCast streams that are actually uh, published on the net yet. Well, they are also published, but that's not what's used as the input here. So, But the IceCast streams are directly used. So IceCast streams go to the iStream system as if it were an IceCast server. And from there, the... Uh, Audio is, uh, in some cases, transcoded, new metadata embedded, and various signals are mucked together to form an MPEG-TS. Of course, these IceCast streams are also the customer's own in a lot of cases. What's also special about this particular case is this also includes IP data, raw IP data being input as well, and also put into the MPEG-TS via a uh, process that's called a multi -program, uh, sorry, multi-protocol encapsulation, uh, MPE is the abbreviation. So this is a very uh, um, complex MPEG-TS in a sense. Obviously also possibility DAB plus to MPEG-TS, very similar. You take a DAB ensemble or ensembles that it exist on the air, demux them and then remarks them to for different purposes, for example, to create a DVB compliant MPEG-TS or any sort of uh, other input or output that you could be thinking of. Uh, and last but not least is one more example uh, using published audio so that some uh, already existing somewhere like a URL of web, rate, uh, web audio or an existing DVB mux, using it as an input and streaming this to an internal, yeah storage or an external so uh, server all for like quality assurance and control so things like legal copy systems etc and for now i hand back to virginie thanks tobias um yes now it's time for our quiz our traditional quiz before uh, before I, I leave the floor to ben geyser so here's a question of the day when and where was the first DAB broadcast? Uh, we would like to, uh, to know the place. We will also uh, like to know the time period and the more precise, the better. So you can, uh, please, you can write your answers in the chat, not to me, but to everybody. And the first one with uh, the right uh, answer or the closest one will win then uh, a nice uh, fan cast t-shirt. So now, uh, Bern Geyser is uh, going to uh, present you the new uh, extreme uh, feature set for receiving multiplex signals. Bern, it's you now. Hello and welcome. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about new features we added for demultiplexing um, signals that are composed of, yeah, that are multiplex signals essentially, so composed of many audios. So um, this is where we came from, and we have seen it in a, in a previous slide. So um, we have a pipe concept where basically from a source, your URL to a sync IceCast, you can configure a connection and you can have processing encoding, encoding and so on. Um, but the previous concept was based on one audio source. So you could have a sound card, RTP stream, some something virtual which is rerouted inside the system or other stuff and then the further processing uh, but very soon we arrived at the questions 
how would we make the audio sources of a multiplex signal available? And um, therefore, our approach to add a new demultiplexing service to the system, which can be configured, as I will show you soon. Um, here's a little screenshot so you can name your demultiplex and select the uh, input format and configure it. So there is a DMAC service that provides all the audio streams of the input multiplex. This is what you get. You get, if possible, metadata from your input multiplex and, if possible, status and monitoring information. Um, then, once that is set up, you can actually move on to the left side and reuse uh, this within your usual pipes. So there's a new source element, which you call DMUX source, where you can easily access uh, the demultiplex audio signal. Within this metadata inserter, you can easily access the uh, metadata that is demultiplexed from uh, your input, for example, DAB, and, and reuse it in your pipe. Then the status and monitoring data is gathered somewhere in a central place. I would show you it's, it's in the monitoring tab of our interface. And based on that, you can, uh, which is a new feature, at configure data watches so you can get some alerting if something is wrong with this data. So, for example, the reception SNR of FM signal drops below a certain value. Okay, um, so a little bit on detail um, about the options. We have this is um, the uh, DAB demultiplex. So, currently, our software supports three input formats. You can for testing stream from a local file in ETI format, which is the DAB signal essentially, or you can pick it up from um, the local network when it is streamed uh, inside it, or you can pick it up from the air, for example. So with uh, this tech tech receiver card, which is depicted here. So you can just plug an antenna and uh, uh, pick up the signal from the air. And with this option, the car is uh, directly supported by our software. You can receive the full ensemble and the metadata. And yeah, very soon we also will add quality monitoring and signal strength monitoring, CSC failures, and so on. And you will see that and be able to be alerted if something is wrong with that. Okay, the same goes for the impact TS or DVB use case. Currently, we have the local file and UDP input available, but a future option is, for example, ASI input, and you could use also a DECTEC card, uh, which is this one. Yeah, this option is currently, to be as mentioned, it in use uh, in a big installation. So we have this 128 program uh, MPEG-TS signal, which we demultiplex and uh, use it for restreaming and uh, reformat into various other formats. Okay, then. As far as FM is concerned, hardware option, which we uh, actually offer by ourselves. So that's a thing we actually also develop by ourselves. So it's uh, called Fan FM. It's one height unit, uh, 19 inch unit, which has FM receiver cards that we developed. So the options are that you can have one or two integrated, um, which amounts to four or eight FM channels. You can have the box as an integrated solution where there is a small PC, actually the audio codec server mini integrated running our software extreme, or you can uh, optionally have that as an add-on solution, which has just the plain USB connection and you put it into your computer, which already runs our software. And then the device is automatically configured and you can use it. Okay, um, now let me show you a little bit around how the whole thing is working. So I'm in the demultiplex menu. Um, and here you see that I created a DAB example demultiplex. Um, you can give it a name. I selected the option that I want to input from this vector card. And all I have to do is select the specific card if I have multiple and I select the DAB channel. It's a 9B with this frequency here. And here you already see the identified channels that are on this. And that's basically all. And here is an example pipe started. 
use a DMUX source. And as channel, I can select the input, which is offered by the demultiplexing service. So just the radio service. Also, I get the audio. In the metadata inserter, I can um, just pick the metadata set, which is automatically generated from the VAB multiplex. So I also chose a rock antenna here. And in this case, I just uh, re-encode to AP3 and stream to Icecast. Uh, you can see it here. This is the Icecast server with a DAB demo and currently playing something with Robert Farmer or something here. Yeah? So um, this is uh, quite nice and actually working. And the second thing I would like to show is the Fan FM, where I can also go to the settings demultiplex menu. And this is if you plug in a fan FM, this is automatically created for you. It says auto detected. So nothing big to configure here. The only thing is you have to set the uh, frequencies which you want to receive uh, local Heinz Live broadcast here in Germany. And um, audio wise, in the pipe menu, it's just the same. You have a demultiplex element and you can pick up Eins Live here. We receive the RDS, the radio text. And uh, this is uh, embedded into our metadata system. So you can pick up uh, Eins Live metadata here. And this is also, in this case, restream to Icecast. And you see here the FM test. Uh, and you see here the, the radio text embedded in the Icecast stream, and you can actually use directly use it. Okay, so what is left is the monitoring use case. Let me go there. This is the monitoring menu, and there is a tab for each detected fan FM. And you see the history of the received SNR, which is actually very bad here because in our office, the reception condition is terrible. So it's SNR received signal strength, whether stereo could be decoded from the FM signal uh, if the RDS could be decoded. Yeah, you can also see only one, so you can deactivate these if you want. And then uh, let me, as the last thing, demonstrate the new data watch feature. Um, so maybe you want to get alerted if the SNR drops below a certain value. This can be configured in this data watch menu and you can create a new one. I have already one active here. You have various options here. So one is I want to monitor the SNR of a fan FM on channel one, and I want to get a warning if uh, the SNR drops below 25. Let's say I change this now. Okay, I save it. And hopefully on the next update, we will see, receive an alert on this. And um, okay, usually it should appear. I should have tested the great period is 30 seconds so it takes some time it may, it may take some time yeah whatever so but you get uh, get an alert there uh, saying that the snr is dropped and you can uh, even via our applet system configure what to do with this alert so one option is that you get informed by email or something else yes so uh, that's basically a short trip of everything we have done yeah so there it is it takes a little while so you have see here that the fan fm on channel 1 live has an snr of 21 db which is lower than the threshold of 25 and it's yellow because it's a warning yeah and this can be uh, taken further to email alerting or uh, external monitoring systems we are cooperating with um yeah several professional providers so um that's what I wanted to show you, and I hope for your questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. I think we already have one uh, question in, in the in the chat uh, from Enrico uh, Pietrosanti. Um, maybe Bernd, you could uh, answer. 
Uh, Tobias is go going now to show you uh, how to use extreme software for in-house streaming. So here we are. So yes, um, in this part, I will give you a, a bit more of a general overview of iXtreme on one hand, and also give you a few more examples of uh, how to use iXtreme for in-house streaming, reusing signals, um, etc. So a little bit broader than what uh, Bernd just showed. The, the basic concept behind the pipes I've already explained earlier, but just as a quick uh, rehash here. So with this one example that we already see here, there's an uh, audio input, maybe an analog or a digital audio interface connected. Um, volume control is enabled, the level is measured. Uh, it is MP3 encoded and then sent out as an ice cast stream. And on the same principle of seeing everything that happens to the audio signal, every kind of uh, pipe can be configured. So to give you one specific example, I had an idea that we could consider a situation much like the last example that I had in the uh, slides earlier, so that you use a URL that uh, already exists on the web and use this as an input for uh, archiving. So in this case, this would be a URL source. Obviously, the IceCast stream exists somewhere on the internet and can be referenced by its URL. You want the your, uh, the level to be measured, the volume, maybe you still want to be able to control it, although it's meant for archiving, but let's just assume so. Let's say you're encoding it AAC, and then you would have a file sync, which is, of course, the, the recorder in the end. And let's say you also want to back up it to a separate system. And just for the sake of argument, assume we're also going to assume you even want it to be encrypted because security is uh, a major concern for you. Then you would have the encryption here and then the archive upload would be uploading this thing that you have just recorded to an external system. So this is the basic setup. And now the detailed configuration could be done by simply clicking on an element and doing whatever uh, configuration is necessary there. So for example, in the URL element, you would of course define where the URL can be found, whether the stream is that is supposed to be used as an input. In the encoder, of course, you could set things like bitrate, etc. In the file sync, you would set things like the, uh, obviously the name or names of the files that you're writing. Uh, there's actually uh, multiple kinds of uh, placeholders that uh, can be used so that the system can automatically fill in changing um, yeah, words based on things like timestamp, uh, stream IDs, or specific tags in the metadata if available. Encryption is, of course, uh, where you could uh, then set up an encryption key. Uh, GPG is what we support in that regard. And then with the archive upload, you set the protocol, the transport protocol for the upload, and of course, where it's supposed to be uploaded to. So this would be a basic example of how to set up a pipe, as I said, for a sort of a restreaming use case. But as you can see here, if you take a look at the um, very broad selection of uh, different sources, that's of course the purple elements, uh, audio processing, red and blue here, uh, encoding, that's of course yellow, and then these things are the various destinations and outputs and so on. So looking at this, you can of course imagine that uh, a great number of uh, use cases are possible, uh, and especially with the um, reuse of streams can set up very uh, yeah complex scenarios, especially since all the sources and things are fully cross compatible. So no matter what kind of source you're using, almost every output or sync in that case uh, would be possible to combine with that. So this way you can also save up on uh, adapters and converters, etc. In a in a lot of cases, assuming of course the base hardware on which iStream is running has the necessary inputs and outputs accordingly, of course. To make this a little bit more interesting, I would like to show you what could look like if you wanted to combine this uh, file streaming with, uh, or this file creation, I should say, with also creating an RTP stream that clients in your internal network could be listening into. So to do so, we are going to take these out and instead replace it with an audio sync. Now, 
have to tick also out the encoder there, as the warning rightly tells me. Now, by default, this would be for a um, for a situation where you're simply outputting the audio via, via an audio interface, of course. However, we have a function that's called virtual ports. And um, the way how you can imagine the virtual ports is that they essentially uh, function a bit like a virtual audio card. The idea is that any signal that is streamed to these virtual ports can then be reused by reusing those virtual ports as uh, inputs for other pipes. So there's actually a few already prepared on the system. I'm just going to say this stereo channel that we called uh, test left and right is the output for this. So what's streamed here is going here. And then this was new pipe 17. Then we use these virtual ports. So test L, test right um, as input for first up the um, RTP signal that I uh, just described. So of course, in this case, you would um, set the uh, port and destination for the RTP stream. Either you're streaming to a specific uh, system where someone can listen to it, or maybe you're using uh, multicast to, of course, uh, stream it to a variety of systems, especially useful if you want to have multiple clients listen to it. And then we just clone this and then we append our um you know the file setup that we just had and this way if now all three pipes are running we can reuse this signal both for the rtp uh, in-house um, system and also do a file recording and also upload it to a separate backup system and of course you could reuse the virtual ports uh, even more times to produce even more different outputs. So this way you can uh, cover a lot of different outputs with just one system and still have fairly precise control about uh, over each of those individual outputs. One other neat thing about uh, iXtream is that, of course, we place a lot of focus on uh, customizability and being able to adjust things to... Uh, you know, be as convenient for you as possible. So of course, this includes things like monitoring. For this purpose, I've actually uh, prepared a specific dashboard. So this is obviously a customizable thing that you can set up however you like. So assuming you wanted to monitor what's going through your system a bit more precisely, where's the other one here, Transcoder. So we have, for instance, this listen in widget with which you can uh, directly access our inbuilt media player. So in this example with the old school telephone ring here, I could immediately um, listen into this now via the system that I'm uh, looking, um, looking at this from, or now that the uh, ringing is over, go over to the, uh, what, the pipe that I call transcoder here, listen to that, et cetera. Well, that was a bit loud. Um, yeah, and this way I can easily monitor multiple connections here via such a dashboard. One interesting functionality that uh, Bernd already mentioned are our applets. So the so-called smart control applets are basically a way how to do a certain amount of automation directly via the user interface instead of you know using our API or SNMP traps, etc., or external management systems. So the idea behind this is that you define a trigger, and when that trigger is in fact activated, then some sort of action is performed. So triggers could be things that are related to date and time, uh, something that happens to a pipe, a specific event that is locked, quick actions is something very specific, uh, not the topic today, but also a very cool feature, certain alarms that are given out, et cetera. So as one example, you could say that uh, every day at a specific time, for example, a message is sent or a, a pipe is activated. Um, it's also very easy for us to new add new triggers and actions if you have something in mind there. But specifically what uh, Bernd referenced was of course the option to send an email um, of course, you could also send this, uh, set this up with, for example, the uh, FanFM monitoring features so that when something happens, when there's a certain issue, 
that a pre-prepared email is sent to an address, for example, to an administrator or technician to immediately inform them of that, even if they're not looking at the system or have any other sort of trap, SNMP traps, etc., configured to be informed. And in fact, um, a, a new feature for this, though this is also really the, the newest version that only includes this, we also have um, the option to include certain placeholders in the email text um, based on the uh, log text to fill in certain details. So you could think, uh, add things like a, a placeholder that will put in the uh, error rate, for instance, when the email is sent out. So the technician will also immediately see this information as well. Yes, and uh, also um, very nice functionality that we have uh, recently um, gotten. You may remember how I showed earlier that there's uh, one project where we receive Icecast streams directly, not as a restream from, from the internet. And uh, for this functionality, of course, it must be possible to use iStream as an Icecast server, and this can be defined here. This is not really meant to replace CDNs. That's not what the system is uh, really built for. As I said, this is really just to uh, a matter of convenience to use Icecast inputs directly, and then obviously from your network in a lot of cases, and then do whatever reuse, stream reuse, in-house streaming you intend to do with those. Yeah, and uh, that would be it for me for now, for giving you a bit of a broader uh, range of examples here. And I give back to Virginie. Thanks, Tobias. And um, I will uh, leave the floor to Detlef Wieser, who is going to uh, give you a, a short uh, summary of uh, DAB, FM, and uh, DDB applications. Yeah, thanks, Virginie. Um, yeah, I emphasize also short. It looks that we keep in time today. So uh, I just realized that we have not uh, talked too much about actually what we have on offer connected with this uh, type of functionality we show today. And what we show today with this workshop and, and all this, this uh, webinar is, is just a, a part of the extreme functionality, which is it's, it's going much wider. I think we gave a bit of an idea in the beginning with the applications. And what we said, um, yes, we um, have developed a software, 24-7 audio software with Extreme. But what we also do is we package it uh, pre-configured, pre-installed on hardware, on servers. And um, probably there is even more a reason when some hardware comes in place, like here on the DAB, DVB and, uh, and FM situation. So although, I mean, I think Bernd Tobias um, outlined that there might be also signals coming from file, coming from IP, but let's say when we really want to receive them on an antenna, we have maybe some reception card also in the in our servers here. So this is, shows an example, which is the uh, uh, audio codec server for, for DAB, has an, um, a reception card inside, could receive then uh, up to three ensembles with the appropriate number of cards, of course, and then have exactly this functionality, what we showed, uh, can receive the ensemble, DMAX, decode, then re-encode to another format, of course, in between select and process, uh, using the metadata on the audio, and then again, stream or store or whatever, which is here indicated with the, with the cloud and the different types of uh, protocols. Then the same is uh, also the application for um, the audio code server DVB, also an example of hardware shown here with a reception card extracting from the DVB multiplex signal also audio services. Um, Tobias, of course, gave a much bigger example with 128 signals. Here I have only, I think, seven. Um, DMAX decode and the same select process um, metadata plus audio encode and having um, certain formats giving it to the cloud or storage or whatever um, purposes. That's, that's the application for the DVB. And then for the FM, also showing the appropriate hardware. So we have the FM receiver, could be four or eight, or even depending if there are multiple fan FM more channels going into USB on our uh, audio codec server here. In this example, it's a mini, a very small device. And then again, uh, a certain set of programs could then be uh, rebroadcasted and reprocessed. Um, this is the, the arrangement of applications uh, when it comes up to combining our software with hardware and pre-configured uh, and pre-installed 
extreme software on the servers we have um, on offer. So I think that's my block of information. And then I give it back to Virginie. And I'm also very excited what comes up here in terms of answers and maybe we can talk a bit about this. Yeah, we are coming to the end of our webinar. So <clears throat> it's time for the, the quiz answer. So we, we had some uh, first answer, which was a bit too uh, early, I think, that left, because the right answer was in Geneva in 1988. We uh, even have a precise period. So if we look at the answer, I think we, had, we have a winner who is the, the closest one to the answer. Yeah, I can confirm and a, a bit background so that there's no misunderstanding. I mean, of course, there were regular broadcasts at some time also, and there were things mentioned like NAK or so uh, in, nine, in the mid of 90s. But the Eureka is much older. The Eureka was funded and started in September 87 to December 91. And there was pre-developments already in the mid of 80s. So the, the EBU is also referring to the first broadcast, official broadcast happened during a World Administration Radio Conference in 1988. That was in the time frame, August to... Because we have the place. Yeah, it looks like I was, I was thinking it was Simon because he was definitely before we showed the slide. But yeah, but I think it was very good. Simon was excellent with saying that it uh, was earlier in Switzerland, Germany. And then I think Manuel gave some some good explanations. And yeah, it goes even further back. I think the, the German aerospace did already something in uh, 83 or so, first ex experiments. But again, as said, the walk, walk up in Geneva, 88, was the EBU states, it's the official one, and there was an ESPAS bus. And I think it was already all according to spec. That's probably a very important thing, that the COFDM, the channel coding and the audio encoding was according to the specifications already was, was fully complying. Okay. Okay, then uh, thanks everybody for your participation and your time. As you can see on this last slide, we are holding a regular webinar um, every uh, two months. So if you are interested, please, uh, save the date. The first one will be on the 25th of April and uh, it will be on audio uh, distribution. Um, we will also be in a different uh, uh, events. This year uh, we were in Hamburg Open in Germany. Uh, we will be in LLB in Norway, then in France for the Red Tech Summit. And we, uh, we will be of course in IBC again this year with the big booth. So we hope to uh, welcome you uh, to welcome you there. We are also in the preparation of virtual roadshow. We will let you know uh, later when we have precise dates uh, in different uh, countries in, uh, in Europe. I think we had some question in the chat that Bernd uh, already uh, answers. Uh, but if you have more questions or if you like a personalized demo uh, according to your needs, please contact us. Uh, Tobias Donbush is your main uh, contact and uh, is uh, always uh, available for you and uh, happy to, uh, to do some uh, personalized uh, demo for you or your customers. Thanks everybody. I wish you a nice uh, day and uh, evening and hope to, to see you in our next uh, webinar. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.